Um, hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, my name is Dean Johnson, and for this uh, for this session this afternoon, I'm your host, facilitator, um, and all-round good guy. <coughs> just to talk about um, language, culture, um, and health services in, in increasing uh, participation of diverse voices. Um, we've got a, we've got a, just before I introduce the panel, um, we've got a couple of rules this afternoon. Um, first off, we'll have um, a microphone traveling around, his mic. And um, as you have questions, we really want this session to be interactive, and it's an opportunity for you guys to ask those burning questions. We've put together an expert panel um, that hopefully will be able to answer all your questions. Um, so feel free to ask, ask whatever, you, whatever you, um, any questions from today or any questions that relate back to your workplace around um, uh, language and culture. So what I might just do is I'll just hand it over to our group and um, get them to introduce themselves. And I believe there's a, a short presentation just as a background um, from, the, from the presenters as well. We're all good. Um, my name's Simon Costello. Um, I'm a Nunakal man from Kwandamuka Nation, um, Minjiriba, which is north of Trebrook Island. And I uh, am a senior project officer and I work in the Cairns, a uh, senior project officer cultural capability. I work in the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Unit in Cairns and Hinalan uh, Hospital and Health Service. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you really enjoy the lunch. <laughs> It's great. First of all, um, I would like to say thank you to um, Health Consumers Queensland to giving this opportunity for me to be in this place today. It's a privilege and honor to be here. Um, I'm, I'm working as a transcultural mental health consumer consultant, and I work for National Consumer and Care Workforce. I'm the consumer representative for National Consumer and Care Workforce uh, MIMA project from Mental Health Australia. Um, apart from that, I work for inpatient units, um, and there's a newly uh, NGO called Culture in Mind. Um, I'm part of that team uh, and uh, World Wellness Group. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jermaine Ishwa. I'm a descendant of the Saibai Kadal Crocodile people from far north Queensland Torres Straits. Um, I'd like to begin by um, just acknowledging the traditional owners and the traditional custodians of the land um, on which we're meeting today and pay respects to the elders, past, present and future. And also um, acknowledge the cultural authority that might be in the room with us today. Um, being from another part of this country and this not being my country, it's uh, respectful for me to acknowledge the people of this land. So I'm a cultural capability officer, sorry, I'm a cultural capability advisor with the uh, Queensland, Queensland Health, um, based here in Brisbane and we're a statewide team. We'll find out a little bit more about that soon. Good afternoon everyone, I'm Julie Rogers. I'm actually a Wapaburra woman. So my traditional country covers the 17 islands known as the Great Keppel Islands. Um, strongly identify with my ancestors who lived on Keppel Island, North Keppel Island, which we call Konomi after the north wind. Um, Goody Dulla is my traditional name, my totem, sea, sea eagle. And um, so because I'm not from this country here, I'd need to follow cultural protocol and acknowledge the Yagara and the Turrbal people of this country as custodians of this land that we're having this event on and also pay my respects to elders past, present and future and um, the cultural authority that's in this room too. I need to acknowledge that. I'm also a cultural advisor along with Jermaine and the cultural capability team and yeah, you'll find out a little bit more about us when we do our presentation. Thank you. Yeah, do you want to, um, do you want to talk to your presentation? Yes. Hi, 
Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk about um, today um, diverse voices um, overcoming language and cultural barriers to call consumer and care participation. So, um, bring all this experience I have all the work experience. Um, today I am have been fa uh, fascinatedly to, to this opportunity to talk about the issues um, the call um, consumers, health consumers has been through and going through. Particularly in mental health, as my experience has been uh, predominantly in mental health, I will be um, talking from that perspective, but many of these issues that will raise all transferable to general health. I hope that this workshop will be a good discussion forum for us all to develop strategies together to ensure all our voices are heard as we are better together. Cultural uh, concepts. Uh, the, this um, slide over there. I would like to talk about uh, how I went through with my uh, own medicine uh, when I was not feeling well. Um, I went back home to Sri Lanka. So it's it's very important for our uh, multicultural consumers um, to what we come from, where what we used to have. So we are so used to those kind of medicine too, because that's our cultural medicine. Um, I, when I was uh, unwell, my my husband took me back to Sri Lanka for um, four months. Um, I had the both. Um, support. So the one of the support I got from uh, Ayurvedic medicine, that's um, because it's so important because I'm uh, when I was a child, I used to have that medicine. So I, I want to have that to go back to even though I was getting the support from mainstream, but meantime, I really need to go back home to have that support because that was something very important to me for my culture. So that really helped me to having those uh, the both side support, and that was a privilege to have that. Um, issues when engaging call consumer and carers, the barriers to participation. Um, it's the, when I was working, I have seen this um, in inpatient unit. The, all the literature, most of them are in English. It's very hard to put the consumer feedback for the call consumers. For them to have that feedback, it's really hard. Uh, some of them can't, cannot speak English or um, they can uh, write or read. So if, that's, if we can have that in different languages, that would be really valuable to the consumer to um, to read and understanding what's uh, what's that feedback is. I'm sure there there are so many consumers I have come across. They want to give a lot of ideas and their feedback to the cons um, to the, uh, the feedback form, but because it's in English, it's very hard for them to um, read or understand. So that's that's one of the the barriers. They they're going through that's uh, it's not it's not in their language so if we can help that to our consumers to call consumers and carers that'll be a great um, thing for them to go through that so they we can get more feedback from our call consumers and carers and the different beliefs for uh, mental illness and consumer participation, that also my lived experience I have come across. Uh, in significant element in my recovery journey is the faith in God is one of my, faith in God is a recovery journey, it's a significant element. But sometimes some people didn't take into that consideration. Uh, it's very important for even my peer workers 
they have the passion. Same as me and all are sitting here today. All of you have got that passion. That's why all of you are here. And the Health Consumer um, Queensland put all this together. I, I, I have seen how hardly how passionate they are to put this together. It's not easy to put this together, but because of your passion, you put all this together, and I'm standing here, and my colleagues, my your people are stand, uh, sitting here. So we came together because of you guys and because of the passion we have. So when we all going through this passion, it's so very important for all of you to acknowledge the other people's beliefs. One of the things I come across is people sometimes they did not recognize my beliefs and they didn't want to recognize my beliefs. So I went through a really hard time with that. I think even my peer workforce, we need to uh, educate them to uh, understand what is the uh, coal consumers believe and where they come from, how important for them to, because that's, that, that's their, their, their faith, their beliefs, different beliefs they have. So we need to acknowledge that. That's one of the things I went through. Um, I was discussing with Kathy sitting there what I went through. It was very, very painful because some people didn't take it to consideration, my beliefs. So I didn't want that happen to any of my coal consumers or carers, what I went through. I really don't want to see that. That was heartbreaking. And on the other hand, I'm really blessed to have an awesome superior, Rita, who is not here today, my manager. And um, um, I, my team is a transcultural, my colleagues out there, um, Elsa, and um, the transcultural mental health, it's like a, we, we are like a family because we come from different cultures, different, even our clinicians, psychologists, everybody, we come together, we work as a team. And I think the main uh, thing is the pillar is my manager who keeps our team really well together. He holds this together. Uh, that's why I think our transcultural mental health uh, team is a bit different because it's the, uh, the main pillar understand about the culture and a strong um, the leadership holding that together. So that's one of the things I would like to uh, mention how great team we have, and it's awesome. Everybody um, have not that opportunity to come to work. So happy to come to work. I am so happy. I'm so excited. I'm so blessed to come to work uh, because I got a great team to work with. That's excellent. So I'm really hoping that kind of a workplace will open the eyes, open the opportunities to my other colleagues, call consumers. So if the organization is seriously about um, hearing diverse voices, it has to take, uh, make the decision at an or original level th uh, that it will take extra resources and time. For example, where I work, we have a large pool of bilingual mental health workers. The capacity issues, we got, um, in fact, over 100 to cover the language and cultural diversity in Queensland, New South Wales. New South Wales. Um, we got bilingual workers, so the cultural interpreters. So if you all need any support, uh, please contact Transcultural Mental Health. So we got uh, bilingual uh, mental health workers who are working and they, they are um, cultural interpreters. Core consumer participation. Um, we have this model. Um, the key participant, uh, the used, the used, the used a community development framework to engage nine coal communities to identify the best way to work with coal consumers. The key principles is the community development in the community. It's so important um, to develop the community. We rather than we we are trying to we we need to go out there. We need to reach out to them to in the community. So it's um, that that that's the model we have 
um, in transcultural mental health, we have organized that model to we, it's really work. So at present, because um, we don't have many resources um, to, to what we want to do. In the near future, if we can get more resources, that will be a great model for us to use there. Um, this, um, this, we, with this model, we can reach out to the community and educate the community leaders. So we need to go out there and educate the community. Uh, so the, a lot of things then, that way, that way stop coming into the inpatient. Uh, when we stop the community. Um, if we can talk to the community leaders and approach to them um, and to uh, educate them, that is the great, great opportunity for we can do that. That's the symbolism of the building a house. After working group and consumer forum, uh, our, uh, we agreed the coal consumed participation model is uh, symbolized by a house with the four pillars and a strong foundation. Foundation is the trust. It's the very hard for coal consumer to trust somebody. That's one of the things uh, the coal consumers take time. They take time. So it's very important when they're in hospital or if you see them in the corridor, just to acknowledge them, just to say hello. More than anything, is a smile is enough for them. I have seen as soon as I entered into the inpatient unit, they come running over to so talking to me, and most of the time, sometimes they haven't even got a smile. So it's very important to acknowledge them, smile, just to say hello to them, uh, even though they cannot speak English. That acknowledgement, it's they very appreciative, and especially in the in that environment, they're isolated. So they don't have anyone to talk to. They don't have their own language person or um, their similarity around them. So they feel isolated. It's very important for acknowledge the consumer. Uh, so that that way they feel they feel uh, valued. So um, I have an incident. I was I walked into an inpatient unit, and this Sudanese boy. He was sitting there. Uh, he was very feeling down. I walked into the first thing I always, when I walked in, I always try to um, go and talk to the um, call consumers because I feel like the mainstream, the support they're getting, mainstream consumers, they get engaged, they interact with other consumers, they feel they, they're connected. But sometimes when the call consumers, they don't feel connected because they cannot speak the language. So when I walked into the inpatient unit, this Sudanese boy was sitting in the corner First thing I saw him in the corridor, I was not even start work. First thing I did was I waved to him. I just put a hand up and waved, and he waved back to me. First time, straight away, I went to talk to the Sudanese boy. He can speak English really well, but he said to me, no one didn't talk to him. And they assume he cannot speak English, but he can. So these, these are the things um, sometimes uh, our coal consumers are facing. So it's very important for us to acknowledge them. Um, foundation, the trust. So that way, if we were with the smile and the, um, just the acknowledging, and then we can build that trust. Understanding the acknowledgement of the diverse cultural beliefs of mental health and mental illness. Communi communication in different languages. Mental health literacy. We need to increase people awareness and understanding. In the foundation is strong and the organization is engaging with coal consumer, then the four pillars must be followed to sustain the coal consumer participation. So th the, if we can build that trust, the trust and understanding and the communication, the acknowledgement, then we can have a great service development. The better service, we, we know that the successful consumer and care participations lead to a better service. But, the, but we need to build that foundation first, the great foundation starting with the trust. Uh, the, 
the model uh, we, we have now, in the past 10 years, we have successfully used this model and engaged uh, uh, of call consumers in a range of uh, participation activities. So we are hoping um, we will be able to take this further. 2012, it has been more difficult as a Queensland transcultural mental health experience, a decrease in resources, and fortunately, we are still there, but we need to build up again. We have the uh, we have the know how how and the network to do. We just need more resources. We need more resources to build this up again. We do, we cannot uh, let it this go down. We need to build that up, and we will build this up again. So we got a great team to build that up, and with all your support, I really appreciate with all your support. We need to build this up again, so then we can have a better community. That's the framework. We, um, another opportunity I have, I want to bring to your attention is a national online framework that focuses on building culturally responsive mental health services. A key element of this framework is a call consumer participation. Everybody probably has seen this. This is the um, framework. You can access this in the internet. Um, it's available. Uh, it's the framework. There's a page. Uh, it's all about the consumer participation. It's more about the consumers and their experiences in that. Um, and I'm part of this, and that was a, a privilege to be the part of the implementing framework. <laughs> Our vision is to grow a network of call consumer and carers to able to participate in mainstream health and mental health participation activities. Consumer and carer participation mechanisms in health services are culturally inclusive. Co-design improved and culturally responsive health services to consumers and carers from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds. Thank you for listening. for that presentation. Um, I'll just get the cultural capability team from Queensland Health um, uh, for, for a brief overview of the services they provide. Thanks, Dean. Thanks, everyone. Um, we've got the tough gig after lunch, so hopefully you can stay awake for a little bit longer. Um, I really just wanted to... Sorry, um, next presentation. Okay. That's all. Sorry, folks, that's better. I just wanted to just spend a little bit of time, not too much time, because we do want to get to the questions around um, what the work Queensland Health is doing, and in particular our team, the Cultural Capability Team. Um, thanks to HCQ for allowing us to be um, a participant um, today. Our work isn't directly focused on consumer engagement, so it's, it's um, important to be upfront about that. But our role is to advocate and be a voice for um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health consumers. So I've been lucky enough to work with HCQ on uh, some of their, their working parties and committees, and it's really about providing that voice for a vulnerable group. A lot of our people, a lot of our families don't engage well with a formal system of complaint or feedback. Uh, we usually vote with our feet, and that adds risk to health outcomes. And we also know that uh, um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people present later at hospitals for chronic diseases. So we need to sort of turn those things around. So to put things in context, we sort of need to go and talk about... Uh, closing the gap, and people might have heard that term. Um, but Queensland Health shares the vision, the national and state vision for improving the health out outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people by um, setting the two targets, closing the gap in life expectancy by 2033 and halving the mortality rate of Indigenous children under the age of five. If you want to know more about closing the gap, you can get onto the Australian Government website um, and also Oxfam um, does some really good work and you can find out ways to get involved in that initiative. 
Um, basically, this graph just shows why there is a national and state commitment around closing the gap. You can see that uh, the blue colour there is the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population, and the greeny colour is uh, other Australians. And already you can notice that there's overrepresentation at every age group around death. So in particular, the one to five age group, the first year being the most critical, and you can see that's about one point times the rate of other Australians. And the other target there was the, the life expectancy. Um, a really horrible graph, but you also need to keep in mind that we're talking about about 2.5% uh, of the Australian population that in some cases is three or four times overrepresented in chronic disease statistics. And when we're talking about life expectancy, that's the gap there. For Queensland, uh, it's about 10, 10 years for males, eight years, eight and a half years for females, and nationally it's a little bit higher. So that, that's just some of the quick rationale around why Queensland Health is uh, committed to, to turning those numbers around. When we look at the, the leading con contributors to the burden of disease in Queensland, uh, mental health has just overtaken cardiovascular disease, but you can see the usual suspects up there, diabetes um, and uh, chronic respiratory disease. Um, I wanted to leave with a bit of a positive note. So there, ha there has been some change um, over the time since they've been collecting data since 2001. Um, we can see that, that between 2001 and 2010, significantly there, there's a 41% decline in um, the infant mortality rates. So that target is actually you know, looking quite good. The life expectancy gap is a little bit more challenging um, because the, the, the standard of living, I guess, in Australia keeps rising. And we, there's argument that, you know, are you really closing the gap? And maybe we need to look at different ways to, to measure that. Um, and also significant, the increase in the proportion of antenatal visits um, by pregnant women. So in Queensland, the making tracks towards closing the gap in health outcomes for Indigenous Queenslanders is the, uh, the policy document. And the strategy that uh, our team um, administers or is framed by is the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Cultural Capability Framework. So this is a significant commitment by Queensland Health um, to ensure that our health services implement strategies that will increase their cultural capability and their responsiveness to cultural needs and interests. And part of that is um, about having cultural competent staff. It's about resource development, um, community and consumer engagement, leadership and partnership, uh, data collection and analysis, recruitment and retention, and interpreter services. So all of those things that our services, our Queensland Health Services, should be considering on that journey towards being culturally capable. Just wanted to sort of, on that last note, interpreter services. Um, there is very much a lack of interpreter services in Queensland, but also probably around the nation, and particularly for where I'm from, and my, my families are from around the Torres Strait region. We've got three, two, two languages, two different languages in the Torres Strait, and one of those has four dialects underneath it. And we also speak um, a, a Creole, a Torres Strait Islander broken English. So interpreter services are very hard to sort of, um, but they're very important as well, obviously. This diagram just um, outlays our framework, uh, our, sorry, the key principles around that framework. So cultural respect and recognition, um, communication, very important. Um, building those relationships and partnerships across the sector, but also with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities and people and capacity building. So you're always reviewing and continuously improving. And we use that, that, uh, that framework to, to engage our, our staff, I guess, and our services. So what our, our, our team does, uh, we are a statewide service. Um, so we've got cultural advisors and we've also got uh, trainers and educators. Um, the cultural practice program is the, the, the training um, component of that framework. And we've recently just um, developed an online program and matched that up with a face-to-face with a -face workshop. We've got a, a statewide network of coordinators in each HHS which deliver that program, but also become a voice again for that, for that health service. 
and we do a lot of resource development around um, guidelines, um, different resources and info sheets that will help our staff um, build their capacity and capability. And just our team, um, Julie's up on the on the stage with us today, but Linda Leach is also here as well. And we've got two cultural capability officers that help us with that statewide mandate. Okay, thank you. Just wanted to sort of put it in perspective and yeah, for the questions. Um, thanks for that for those um, overviews and um, uh, presentations. I guess now the most important part I think is that we've got a panel here that can answer the questions and answer concerns from you um, for your health services for your areas. Um, so what we'll do is we've got um, for questions for the panel. If we could just get you to raise your hand um, and we'll get the um, microphone around. Um, I just just cause so we don't sit up here and do nothing. If no one asks any questions, I'll just pick people to come. <laughs> so if, if, feel free to interact or we'll, we'll get you to interact. So however this works. Um, but feel free, put your hands up if you've got some questions. <laughs> Um, yeah, hello. Um, I was interested interested in the um, in the um, the issue regarding uh, deaths and, and illnesses. Does it affect people more in in your people more in the um, rural country areas or, or the city? What's the what's the um, the percentage there? Is there a difference? In illnesses and deaths, yeah, break right, basically. I, I don't know the um, the stats off the top of my head for those regionals, but the the issues are obviously access and remoteness play a key factor in that. Yeah. Those numbers that I put up, um, age by death, were national stats. So you know you'd need to sort of get back to the regions to to find out the those those specific stats, but definitely access and remoteness. Um, play, play a part. Um, I can probably just add a little bit more to that whilst absolutely agreeing that access and remoteness um, impact that. I'm from Brisbane North PHN and we have done some recent studies on our population and certainly the same gaps exist for our population here in Metro North Brisbane um, in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities that exist across Queensland and nationally. So uh, it doesn't seem to be just the access and remoteness that is the issue. The, the, the consistency across both urban and rural populations exists. So. We, I'll just add on to that. Um, regardless of where we are, whether it's an urban, regional, or remote community, um, the fact is history has played a large part in mistrust with the health system, and we don't fit the way that we see our health and what will make us better is in um, contrast to the health system that operates today. And that legacy and uh, transgenerational trauma and distrust really comes into that as well. So um, that's why access is an issue even in urban uh, communities where there's plenty of services. Um, and how we get treated at those services is very real and adds to that too. So it's not just an issue out for remote and urban communities. Yeah, is this on? Yeah. I, I just want to add to that um, <clears throat> That it's, it you know, and reaffirm that it is is about access, um, but also we have some performance indicators, and particularly in, uh, I think they're statewide performer performance indicators around discharge against medical advice and potentially preventable hospitalisations, and as you go throughout across the all of the health services across Queensland. It's alarming to see that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are work, walking away from receiving life-saving treatment, and uh, and they're actually readmitting again within 28 days of the first time they discharge against medical medical advice. So there's a, when those sorts of stats are, are continually there and rising, you start to have to think about what is what is going on. What can we do better to make sure that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people stay in the care, at least for the time they can be treated, and when they leave, 
that they can care for themselves better in their homes so they prevent from turning up and admitting again. And, you know, we want to try and keep them in their homes and prevent them from getting sick. So there's obviously something wrong with the system. So, uh, you know, we're lucky that we have a statewide cultural capability team. However, it's it's more than just Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that have got to make these changes. Um, and, you know, the partnerships extends to non-Aboriginal people to take some leadership as well. I'm sure that you know the Indigenous Consumers Liaison Officers in different hospitals. You are aware of the um, health consumers specifically for Indigenous communities or Indigenous consumer in hospitals, in different hospitals. So my question is, um, how we can help consumers in navigating, called consumers, in navigating the system without having this job? Because actually, whenever I ask about, do we have a similar job to that job, but only like multicultural consumer as an officer in the hospital, they say, oh, no funding. So from your um, thinking or perspectives, how we can cover this area without having this job in in the time being, how we can help consumers navigating the system from your services. Thank you. Um, yes, I when I was working in the inpatient unit, that's what the question you're asking is it's very important for us to have um, call consumer and care working in the um, in the inpatient unit. Um, it's we need to we need to um, those fill those gaps. We need to speak up and fill those gaps. It's very important because other people cannot fill that gap. Um, we we need to have the consumer and care call consumer and care working. I remember years ago um, I used to say that in a meeting people used to laugh at me. I say what you're talking about, but it, eventually now it has come. And now that position is has opened and it has come. Those days, I, every meeting I attend to, um, I mention to them, we need a call consumer or carer, an Aboriginal um, leader working in the community, in the inpatient units. Thank you. 